Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming tonight, sacrificing a Tuesday evening to come out on a very important topic. I'm Mark Olbert. I'm uh, currently the chair of the city council, sometimes known as the mayor. Um, and uh, I, I really, as I said, appreciative of the fact that there's so much outpouring of interest in San Carlos on this topic. Uh, I suspected in part it was sparked by some of the tragedies that occurred last year in, in California and in places like Paradise, but it's a sign of how strong San Carlos is that there are that many people, as you see around you tonight, who want to get involved and make the community safer, both for themselves and for others. So um, a couple of just sort of housekeeping points I want to go over. Uh, you probably have noticed the cameras that are around the room. We are actually videotaping everything that happens here tonight for the benefit of the community members, unlike yourselves, who couldn't come here tonight. So that's eventually going to be posted on the website. Um, the uh, uh, city staff is going to be coordinating and, and consolidating all of the ideas and the input that comes out of this process that you're going to contribute. That will also be posted publicly and made available um, for everybody to see. Uh, and it will also serve as the primary source of input to the city council when my colleagues and I start debating and discussing what steps we ought to have the community take. Because I can assure you this is a very important topic to everybody on the dais. Um, the fact that I'm the only one here tonight is not a sign that it's not important. It's just a sign that we're not allowed to have more than one or two of us at a time in any room talking about local issues uh, without making it a formal council meeting, and we didn't want to do that uh, tonight. So um, with that, just uh, a couple of other brief thanks for some individuals who are here. Uh, you saw Dave Pucci, our fire chief, uh, actually open up tonight. Uh, he's with the Redwood City Fire Department. We also have uh, Stan Maupin, who's the fire chief for uh, Redwood City here as well. They are a phenomenal outfit. Um, I personally think they're probably one of the best fire service, or probably the best fire service organization in San Mateo County, which is why we partnered with them uh, to provide fire service for San Carlos. We also have Sergeant Jake Trickett. Um, I did get your last name right, right, Jake? Good, because I don't want to be arrested or anything. Okay, thanks. So um, with the sheriff's office, he's here tonight as well. Uh, we have Stephen Machida, who's our uh, director of public works for the city. We also have Jeff Maltby, who I saw someplace around, though he's in the back now, our city manager. Um, Tara Peterson, our assistant city manager. Nakaya Nachman, Jeff's executive assistant. Brian Carey, our communications coordinator. So we have a whole bunch of people here from San Carlos to make sure this evening uh, fulfills its promise. We also uh, I'd like to thank the folks from Millbrae TV who are doing the recording I mentioned. And lastly, uh, besides thanking Hiller for making the space available, I also want to thank the Peninsula Conflict Resolution Center people who are here tonight and who I'm going to turn over this meeting to to get actually the work started to uh, Ann Burrs, who is right here. Thank you, Ann. Thank you, Mayor Olbert. Uh, I want to thank you all for coming, and I want to uh, introduce myself. I'm uh, Ann Burrs. I'm with Peninsula Conflict Resolution Center, and I'm um, a collaborative processes coach. Um, I want to mention that our uh, agency, if you haven't heard of us, we are a, a dispute resolution and communication organization. We also do community engagement, uh, bringing people together with uh, their community leaders to give input and have discussions about issues that are important to them. Um, so we're also neutrals in this process. We're here to uh, facilitate your small group discussions and take notes and um, hopefully give you the chance to uh, get to know each other a little bit and share information and give your input tonight. So I'd like to uh, turn it over uh, to Fire Chief Dave Pucci, who will be uh, providing a presentation for you tonight. Thank you, appreciate it. So uh, thanks for coming out tonight. Um, we did this Saturday morning, and on Saturday we had about 80 people join us for that presentation. I think we're probably up to about 140 or so. It'll be interesting to see the sign-in. So it's a great turnout. Thank you for doing that. Um, I'm going to start off by making the camera guys mad at me because I'm going to leave the podium. And uh, we're going to talk about some of the questions that we had earlier. 
have you prepared a personal family emergency plan? And looks like a good chunk of you have, but maybe a little less than 50%. And we're gonna be talking about so the planning that you can do for your family and the planning tool that we've provided to all of you as well. The next question was, have you planned escape routes and alternative routes to leave your neighborhood? And that is also uh, pretty good. Um, probably a few more saying no than yes, but a, a pretty good uh, amount of you have planned for that. And do you manage the vegetation around your home? And by a, by a long shot, looks like most of you are, so that's great news. We'll talk about some of the methods that you can use to maintain the uh, clearances around your house, what our recommendations are, and uh, point you to some resources that we have for you. So we're gonna start off by talking uh, a little bit about California and what's going on statewide. You guys have seen the news a lot lately. You've seen what happened in Paradise, um, <coughs> excuse me, around the state over the last couple years. In California, we're seeing some pretty significant changes in the way fire is behaving. Now, we know about the drought and the fact that we had several years of drought, and what that did is weakened a lot of trees throughout the state in the millions of trees, and they were susceptible to things like the bark beetle, and there's a high tree mortality rate. So if you look at areas like Mariposa County, um, you'll see large swaths of land that just have dead trees, and it's a big problem for the state. So what happens is when you have those conditions in the state, and even when we have a really wet winter like we did this year, when everything warms up, those dead trees do not hold moisture like live trees do. They dry out very quickly and they just provide for a tremendous amount of fuel. Um, so we're going to see some major fires this, this winter. What's going to be new this year because we had such a huge wet winter for us? Um, driving around the hills along 280, you see a lot of nice green grass, looks great this time of year. Well, that's going to be a really big grass crop for us this year too, and that is that light, flashy fuel that's easy to ignite. And we'll talk about how you maintain uh, clearance around your house and why it's important to clear that out as well as some other things. So, so the, the predictive services right now in California are saying that because of this grass crop, because of the winter that we've had, and because of the drought and climate conditions that we've seen over the last several years, we're going to see an above average fire season for, for our area. So what we've seen around the state, and this is uh, up through 2012, but it really the trend continues, is our fire season has gotten longer. So since 1973, we've seen the fire season continue or grow by 92 days per year. And I could tell you that the last couple years I've been on fires in November and December um, in Southern California, the Paradise Fire was also a very late season fire. We're just seeing the fuel conditions being able to carry uh, rapid fire growth for a long period of time. Um, so that is, that is a common occurrence now. It didn't, uh, November and December fires a couple of years ago were, were pretty much unheard of. So what's changed? We know that overall our, our our temperatures are increasing and that leads to drier fuels it also leads to increased wind events so those wind events are what are a big concern for us when we see uh, those dry offshore winds that's when you start seeing drier air and you're seeing that that air mass go out towards the ocean that's the, all that hot air is coming from the central valley and it's coming over here and drying out our fuels and driving the fires so Part of the situational awareness for all of you that we're gonna talk about is recognize those weather patterns. You'll see it on the news. Uh, for me, I know it's an offshore wind event when every single neighbor's leaf is in my front porch. That tells me that we're having dry offshore winds. And that's that first part of that situational awareness for you to start thinking of, okay, this might be a, a, a kind of a dangerous day for fires. Obviously, if it's August, September, October, it's even more important because those fuels have had all summer to dry out with the warm weather. So another big thing that has changed is if you look at San Mateo County from the 1970s till now, there's a few more people living here, right? We notice that with the traffic, we notice with where we're building homes. So there are homes in areas that didn't used to be built in. They were, they were down to close to that El Camino corridor and uh, we have, we, we've continued to spread out because we need the housing. That's a major issue for us too. Um, so with that comes some risk. If you are in that area, you, you know when you have those trees and those brush close around and in between homes, that can carry fire very rapidly. Um, legacy infrastructure. 
So what I mean by that is when the roadways, some of those roads came into existence when San Carlos wasn't even a town yet. Um, in Redwood City, we have old logging trails that turned into streets. Those weren't, were not part of a planned community. They just happened as the area became inhabited. So up through the early 1990s, um, when the fire code started dictating some mandatory minimums for roadways, it wasn't until then that you started seeing those newer roadways being built for a, a bigger purpose of being able to get fire apparatus into neighborhoods and to be able to get people out. So if somebody's gonna build something new today, uh, what you'll see is the requirement is you have to have a 20 foot wide roadway and it has to be at least thir uh, 13 and a half feet clearance vertically so we can get our equipment in and out. But the infrastructure that was in place before, there's a lot of roads, as we all know, being San Carlos residents that are, that are pretty narrow. And that's that legacy infrastructure problem that we have. We talked about the, uh, the, like the fire season, um, but also in California, we're seeing a changing in, of the vegetation in some areas. So when we're talking about that, those high tree mortality rates, those trees aren't coming back necessarily. They're calling it the, the desertification of California and the fuel models are changing in some ways. So what that means is uh, we could have changing fire behavior in areas that we didn't normally have that before. So someone asked me about fire history in, in San Carlos. Was anybody a resident around 1970 that might recall there being a pretty significant fire? Um, data from those fires is pretty difficult to come by. Um, but that was Devonshire Canyon, and that was less than 1,000 acres. Um, so Cal Fire at the time, actually it would be the, the Forestry Division of California at the time, um, didn't keep really good data at fires that were less than 1,000 acres. Um, but they do have the, uh, the records that this did happen. It started around Kings Court, burned towards uh, Melody, and uh, that's still an area of concern. If you look at that area, we, it's very easy to tell that that could be an area that would be a concern. So again, thinking about those offshore winds that we talked about, fire moves the most rapidly when you start having winds in alignment with canyons, right? So that funnels all that energy from the wind and that will push a fire very, very quickly. So if you start thinking about a canyon that is in alignment with the wind, that's when we're the most concerned when we're fighting a fire and where we're gonna put our resources. So we're actually able to find a uh, old photo. Um, it's really hard to see but this is that 280 corridor, um, and you can see that through here, there's a few more homes in there today than there were back in 1970, right? So that's, that's the nature of our fire problem in that area. This next picture is in here just because I thought it was cool, um, with the World War II era bomber that was converted for firefighting use, but these were, these were basically the records that we were able to dig up to actually find that, uh, that fire uh, history. So other than that, in San Carlos, the state maintains a really big database of fire history. So you may see that on the news when there's coverage about a major incident somewhere. They'll show the fire like up in Santa Rosa, and you may have heard about a fire that happened about 30 years earlier. And if you overlay the fire history with the current fire map, they're very, very similar. So we see fires in different parts of the state end up repeating over and over again. What's changed is what's in that footprint of that fire and we're seeing that there's homes there now, and that's when we see events like Paradise and Santa Rosa, but the, because the topography is still the same. So it just takes time for those fuels to grow back and the right wind event or right weather conditions to duplicate what happened 30 years. You look at areas like Butte County, you'll see a faster cycle than that. You'll see fire history repeating itself like every 10 years because that fuel model takes that long to grow back and for the right set of circumstances to happen again to repeat the, repeat the past. So the state maintains something called fire severity maps, okay? This is San Mateo County. So the gray area is just a built out area. That's not a big wildfire problem. That's, it's, it's like the downtowns and everything like that. And you can see that there's a pretty big concentration of red and that's in between 280 and about Alameda that goes up and down the peninsula and affects a lot of different communities, right? Throughout the county, the, the fuel model is very similar from San Carlos to Hillsboro. It's, it's the same stuff that would burn. And it's really these areas that have the topography that would support a major event. And there's some areas out on the coast. And then the pink is kind of a lesser degree. Of, there's a fire hazard there, but the most severe are the red ones. And if we zoom in, this is San Carlos. And you can see this is around Alameda, so it's everything 
to the west of that. And it makes sense, right? If you think about what your neighborhood looks like, how the houses are in, intermixed with the, uh, with the fuels. So that these areas are also hilly. So we have the fuel. If we get that offshore wind event, it's going to be coming this way. And the topography goes uphill towards, uh, typically, towards 280, right? So we would have that slope that would help move it. And then a lot of urban interface uh, structures within that area that we would have to defend. So this is the current uh, state of the state as far as the drought goes. So it's been great news for our water supply. Um, all the uh, reservoirs are full. We're going to have plenty of water for the winter. We have a huge snowpack. Um, but what does that do for the fire problem? These uh, yellow areas down here, that really has more to do with aquifers than it does with fuel moistures. So everything's nice and, and damp around the state right now. Uh, but, but again, it's going to be that grass crop that's going to be the problem. So the impact of fire season, again, predictive services for our area, San Mateo County, is predicting an increase in fire activity for the coming fire season, which really, we consider fire season to be year round. We keep our equipment on the rig all year round. We will go to grass fires at times of the year that you would never expect it. Um, but really, it's going gonna, it's gonna to start peak, you know, growing July. It typically peaks around October-ish, and then hopefully we get some rain in November to slow down the uh, to slow down the, uh, uh, the fires. So what do you get with response? The good news is in San Mateo County, uh, we behave like one big fire department. There is one dispatch center that's in Redwood City, and from Daly City to Menlo Park to Half Moon Bay, we are all on the same dispatch center. So when you call 911, they'll answer. You'll say that there's a fire somewhere, and you will get whatever the closest resources that are required for that incident. So if it's a medical emergency, you get the closest engine. If it happens to be a Belmont engine coming into San Carlos or Redwood City coming to San Carlos, you get the closest resource to have the most rapid response. If you get a structure fire assignment or a grass fire assignment, it is routine to see a lot of different agencies pulling up to the scene. So we don't care what it says on the door. We want the closest resources to get there. So. The local fire resources, uh, we can go quite large um, on incidents. So for the uh, San Bruno gas pipeline explosion, uh, we had eight alarms there uh, very rapidly. And while that was going on, there was another 62 incidents throughout San Mateo County, and we were still able to meet our response time goals because the way the system behaves. So we can get a lot of resources to anywhere in the county very, very quickly. Um, also on the uh, Albion fire, uh, which was in Woodside, I'm uh, forgetting what year, but that was a grass fire up in the Woodside area. We had six alarms that responded to the grass fire, and then a structure caught fire in Woodside, and that was a second alarm fire. So we have eight alarms going through that. And again, we were able to support that throughout the county because if a big incident happens in the south end of the county, all the resources from the north will just redistribute throughout the county and continue to respond to those 911 calls. So it's a very, very robust system. If um, once we get to a point where we need more help from our neighboring agencies. In California, we're very, very fortunate um, that we have a statewide mutual aid system that we can bring a tremendous amount of resources to, to an incident. So we will routinely get resources from Santa Clara County, Alameda County, San Francisco County, and we will go, they will come across the border to help us too. Um, we're both fortunate and unfortunate that we actually test that system very, very frequently during the summertime because you'll hear on the news that San Mateo County is sending out strike teams to the North Bay fires or down to Malibu. It happens every single summer and we can get resources from throughout the state very quickly and we have the incident command system that allows us to support very large responses. I've been on fires with 8,000 firefighters on one incident and they're able to feed and fuel and keep that, that firefight going on for weeks at a time. It's really impressive. We also get this last summer up in Shasta, we had uh, fire resources from New Jersey. We had uh, people coming in from Texas and Colorado up to Northern California. So this, this summer in particular, we really stretched the boundaries of our mutual aid system. We had hand crews that actually came from Australia and New Zealand because that's their off season um, to help us with fires in California. And uh, they work and they very similar to us. You just, you can't understand a word they say on the radio. Um, <laughs> But that's how big it can go. So during, the, I mean, I don't even know what the total numbers over, over the peak of the fire season in California, but we had thousands of resources brought in from out of state. 
So we recognize that in San Mateo County, um, there are the, what we call the SRA, that's the state response area. So that would be, CAL FIRE would be the primary agency that would respond to that. Local response area means it's in the city limits of San Carlos, and that's our responsibility. But we have mutual threat zones too, meaning fire doesn't care what city it starts in. If something starts on the border with Belmont, that's a threat to us. So we both are in agreement that we're gonna provide resources to fight that fire. Um, during the summertime, there's a system in place that uh, we take a series of weather measurements and it comes out of Cal Fire and Felton. And depending on what the weather conditions are, will dictate what our response is on any given day if somebody calls up and says, I see a grass fire. If it's bad weather conditions, we have those offshore winds, you can get up to 15 engines and aircraft taking off at the time of dispatch um, to respond to that because of the weather conditions and the fuel moisture and all that. If it's a normal day like today, you would get a much smaller response because we know the fuels are still moist, we don't have an offshore wind event, you're gonna get a standard response. But we can, go, we can go big, we front load our response because we wanna be able to catch these fires very, very quickly. Um, I talked about the incident command system, but that is a system that we've been using uh, in the, since the 1970s when they're having the large fires in Southern California. And what happened is in, in, for September 11th, uh, the federal government decided that they needed to have a management system for all of these major emergencies, whether it is the Twin Tower collapse or major wildfires or oil spills. And they looked around the country and said, well, California does this a lot and they've been doing this for a long time. So they got our system and they kind of changed it up and they called it the National Incident Management System and told all the other states that's what we have to do. So we're all speaking the same language. So if I go manage a fire in Colorado, it's gonna be really, really similar to the way that we manage something here in California. So it worked out great for us because we didn't have to learn something new, but the rest of the country was probably a little mad at us, but that's okay. So we talked about high risk days. Um, when we do that and we're in incident command, we'll work in what's also called unified command. And what that means is the, the, the stakeholders within an agency, so for us, if we have something that's working in San Carlos, we're gonna really work closely with our law enforcement partners because they have that evacuation responsibility and we're gonna be standing side by side as we manage that incident. So it's not just about the fire department, you're gonna have a law enforcement response, public works might be coming out and helping us with certain things. It's gonna be, we're gonna bring everything from the government to bear to deal with an incident. So, and when we do that, um, it just makes it a cleaner response. It, it, may, it enables us to be able to get whatever resource we need to to the fire to actually deal with it. Our communications were very fortunate again because we have that one dispatch center. So if we end up getting a uh, fire engine from Daly City come in to us, help us, we're able to talk to them just as easily as we could talk to a Redwood City fire engine. So it works very well. And incident complexity, we're seeing fires change in California where they're going from a start to a very complex uh, incident very, very quickly. So we can go in California because of the system that we have in place is we can go and manage an incident with 8,000 firefighters and bring in incident management teams and other resources from out the state to be able to handle very complex incidents. Um, and that work that happens every single summer and it gets exercised very, very frequently. So let's talk about evacuations. This is, this is really high on the radar of everybody because of what happened in Paradise. Um, we have some problematic roads in San Carlos, but we also have more of a network of roads in San Carlos, okay? So what do you do for planning for evacuations? In the packets that are sitting on your table, is you, all of you have a planning tool, okay? We'll talk about some of the main roads that we want you to consider and, and how to get out of your areas, but some of you may end up or live on long cul-de-sacs. So you need to look at your neighborhood and Decide what's gonna be best for you and have alternates uh, ahead of time and think about it. And I would recommend rehearsing it as well, okay? What is the difference between a warning and an order, okay? In the initial stages of a fire, what's gonna happen is we will get dispatched to a grass fire at some spot in town. We might even see a column of smoke when we first roll out of the station, but we're not gonna really know exactly where it is until we get eyes on it and see what the behavior is, okay? It's going to take time for us to gather the information on what the fire is doing to decide what is actually threatening, okay? So for your neighborhoods, what we're gonna tell you right now is if you're, especially if you're in one of those difficult areas to get out of, is don't wait for us to tell you to leave. Just go, you are empowered 
to say, okay, I'm gonna get out of here and get out of the way um, now, and then I'll just return to my home later when I see that there's no more smoke coming up, or I do get that notification at some point saying it's safe to return. Because there is going to be a period of time where we have to gather the information we need to be able to notify the public, okay? And when we do, in the initial stages, it's gonna be very broad, right? We're gonna, we're gonna come up with a very hasty evacuation order that's gonna say, if you're in this area, leave in this direction, and it's gonna be very hasty. As we go on, if we get those, uh, in other parts of the state, if we get those fires that goes on for days or weeks, what we do is we develop a series of trigger points and an evacuation area. So if a fire hits a certain point, then we say evacuate all of this. And if it hits the next point, then it gets bigger and it just grows as needed. Um, but that is for those events that have become long term. For the short term, it's going to be very down and dirty, basic information. If this is your neighborhood, it's time to go now. But again, if you, are, you know your neighborhoods, you know how difficult it's going to be to get in and out, and it's going to be different for everybody in this room, um, you need to make that decision for yourself if you see something that you're concerned about. Okay. Also, when we're talking about considerations, um, the fatalities that we saw up in Paradise, those were typically the very young and the very old. So it was people who were dependent on other people um, to actually get out of that area. So part of this and part of the reason why we had you all do that exercise of meeting somebody and learning what they're here to uh, do is we want you to meet and talk to your neighbors. Um, a question came up um, uh, on Saturday when we did this about Hallmark and Crestview, and there's a gate there, you can't go, right? So someone asked, well, what if I can't get out on Crestview? I can only get out on Hallmark. And my suggestion is, I'd wanna make a really good friend on the Hallmark side that I can call up and say, hey, we're evacuating your direction, and, and you can do that for them too if they need to come this way. Um, so it's that kind of relationship and, and thinking things through ahead of time that will enable you to make that decision quickly. Um, in your workbook also, there is information on have you considered what you would want to grab when, uh, when you leave your home? What's important to you that you can actually do quickly? Um, I was on a fire up in uh, Butte County and there was a neighborhood that was just devastated and on some of the homes, the only thing that was left was the front porch and there were stacks of things that those people thought were important to them at the time that they were trying to load in their car and then at some point decided, okay, it's time to go and they left that stuff behind, right? So I'm not sure they really thought through what they absolutely want to grab before they go, but that's something to think about that's in your planning kit. <clears throat> so I had a question, um, why do we not have signs that say this is your evacuation route like they do on the coast for, for a tsunami? And the answer to the, that is we always know a tsunami's coming from the west. Um, that's pretty predictable for that. We don't know the direction of the fire spread, so that is something that we would have to determine at the time of the incident and communicate that through you, to you. And we'll talk about the uh, notification systems that we, uh, that we uh, use in this county and how to sign up for it. So know your evacuation route, have some alternates for yourself, work with your neighbors, especially if somebody's going to need some help, or maybe you're the one that needs some help and support from your neighbors, and, uh, and talk about that and meet with them. And again, don't wait, evacuate. And that's gonna be part, there's a video coming up that's gonna talk about ready, set, go. Be ready to react when we are in the summertime. This is something that, it's a hazard that we have to live with in California, just like earthquakes, right? We know they're gonna happen. We can't stop an earthquake. We can do tremendous and, and great vegetation management throughout the state, but we are still going to have a fire. Um, I was at a fire last, uh, last December down in LA by Malibu, and that was a desert interface fire. There weren't a lot of trees, it was the desert, but it was still a very fast moving 92,000 acre fire um, in that fuel model. So we, that's something that will always be in California. So early detection also, so, um, I'm sorry, let me, I don't wanna skip over things. Know your travel routes. What's a refuge area? What, what comes to mind when you, when you think refuge area? And for us in San Carlos, it could be getting up to 280 if it's gonna get you out of the area completely. Um, but also, we're gonna want you to go towards that El Camino corridor where the fuel model changes, it's less of a wildfire threat. For us, that offshore wind is gonna be pushing the fires that, are, are, that we're concerned about towards 280. And um, so you need to think about coming towards that, that industrial area of San Carlos to get out of the way, let those resources go in. Um, I would also suggest that if you can, get your family in one car as opposed to taking multiple cars out there and it's going to be crowded when people are trying to leave. Um, so plan for trying to get out in one vehicle if you can. 
Um, early detection, so there is a lot of new technology out there. One of the things that we would want you to discuss in your small groups is there is new technology. Have you guys heard about uh, fire detection cameras? There's probably a lot of seen on the news. And there's some systems going in place uh, in, in various counties. I don't have a definition of what the system that we will look at will look like, but typically they are thermal cameras. Some have a video component to it. Some are monitored by software that will trigger an alarm and let us know that there's a fire somewhere. Um, there's a lot of different options and there's new technology coming in every day. Um, so it's really hard to say this is what the best system for San Carlos would be. But my question for you and your groups is, how do you feel about if those cameras were put in certain neighborhoods of the city? Do you have, I, we heard some privacy concerns uh, over uh, on Saturday, or you think they're great. Whatever feedback you have for us, we want to capture that in our, in our subgroups. So what are we doing to prepare? So we're doing this, this is public education. We've, uh, we do a lot of this, we meet with a lot of people um, over the course of the last couple of days. We, um, for those of you that live in the, uh, the hazard area of San Carlos, we sent you a mailer last year talking about defensible space around your home, how to actually harden your home. Um, and also we updated our website. There's tons of information on our website that you can go to that will talk about specific things that you can do with, with regards to your roofing material, your siding, um, the vents on your house, the fuels around your house, what to clear out, okay? So there's tons of information there. There's a lot of information on the table in front of you. Um, we are doing a tremendous amount of uh, fuels management in San Carlos right now. So between a couple different grant funding sources, we've, we're coming close to a million dollars that we received in San Carlos. And what we're using that money for are for the city owned lands um, to clear out the perimeters of like Eaton Park and, and put fuel breaks in there um, throughout the city owned lands. We can't use it for private property. It's, it can, it's only for publicly owned lands. So there's gonna be a lot of work going on over the next couple of years that you'll see going on in the hills. And we'll notify you, but you're gonna see equipment in there, you're gonna see hand crews going in there to clear out some brush, you're gonna see some goats the, with the grass crop this year, we're gonna have a lot of fat goats in, uh, in San Carlos. Um, and that the, it's, there's so much work to do, it's gonna take us a while to get through it. Right now we're going through environmental review um, with FEMA that we have to submit to that so they approve our plan. And uh, that's happening uh, hopefully in the next month or so and we're gonna start putting, there's only a window of time that we can do it in the year or two, right? We have to let the grass get to a point of certain of being somewhat dry, remove it um, before it gets too hot to use equipment because we don't want to start a fire doing fuels management, which does happen. Um, in addition, we've done some wildland urban interface inspections. So throughout the high fire se uh, severity zone, our engine companies go out and it's in the spring and they will look through neighborhoods and uh, different properties and look for code violations of, of just lack of fuels management around homes, okay? Uh, we issued I want to say it was 379 um, inspection forms last year notifying residents that they needed to do more around their property. And we gained compliance by educating, um, giving suggestions on what people can do or need to do around their homes. So we want that 100 foot dis uh, defensible space or to your property line, right? A lot of us don't have 100 feet from our house to our property line, so you, you can go that far. If you live on a hill, if, if it's uphill towards like the back of your house, if you have the property to go further than 100, uh, 100 feet, it's definitely suggested because you have that, that hillside is gonna lend itself towards, towards fuel, uh, the fire advancing quickly. Um, and we also are working on a uh, evacuation plan. We're actually in June, there's gonna be a neighborhood in San Carlos that we're gonna be reaching out to uh, pretty soon and trying to get them to play on a very early Saturday morning and we're going to be doing an evacuation drill and we're going to be doing that uh, June 8th, right? It's going to be on June 8th and uh, what we're going to be using that for is to test our interoperability between law enforcement and fire. We're going to be using it with how well the communications with all of you work and take that sampling of that city to also validate our, our evacuation plans and tools. We're doing a lot of mapping and fuel modeling. So um, all the county, um, actually Santa Cruz County is already done. San Mateo County is going to be breaking the entire county down into grids and it's going to be kind of going by topography where we're gonna be able to have a fuel model and a structure count within that area, what the evacuation routes are and link that to the emergency notification system so we can evacuate by zones as well. So there's a lot of work that's going on right now and has been going on uh, for several years now. 
So communications, we're starting to get to some of the stuff that you can do. Um, you have the Ready, Set, Go uh, paperwork in front of you that's gonna talk about your, your personal planning, um, what you need to do ahead of time, what you need to be prepared to do in the moment to keep yourself safe. Um, how many of you have signed up for SMC Alert? Okay, a pretty good number. For those of you that haven't, um, you have a pamphlet in your handouts that will talk to you about SMC Alert. That is one of the tools that we have to be able to uh, alert you uh, very rapidly during an emergency. If you are interested, we can even sign you up tonight. Nolene's in the back of the room. If you want to raise your hand, Nolene. Nolene can help you sign up tonight, okay? It's very important that we have you in there. And through SMC Alert, um, you also have the opportunity just to receive an alert. Uh, so for those of you that are SMC Alert, you've gotten the, the mountain lion uh, warnings when there are sightings. Same kind of thing, but we're gonna let you know about red flag warnings. So that'll be something else for your situational awareness over the course of the summertime. So what can you do? First off, again, sign up for SMC Alert. For you, on your private property, your defensible space, okay? Look at the tools that we've given you and the suggestions on what you can do for your home, and there's a tremendous amount of things that you can do to make your house much more survivable. You will see uh, in the video that's coming up pretty quick here an example of what is what we consider a very defensible home that would be uh, uh, likely to survive during a fire. Um, hardening your home, that refers to those structural things that you can do, the right type of roofing material. Keeping your gutters clear from that debris, that's something that catches on fire frequently is all that stuff that gathers in your gutters, um, it dries out during the summertime, that's a great receptive fuel bed on a house. So it's not just about what's on the ground around your house, it's also that. Um, have a plan, and I will absolutely tell you it's important that you actually practice it to make sure it works for you. Um, it's, it's just doing a, a fire drill on a different scale. And then if something is happening in your neighborhood, especially in those more difficult areas to get out of, don't wait on us to tell you to leave. Go ahead and take that, that initiative yourself to leave. You can always come back if it turns out to be a nothing, okay? So next slide is gonna be a video that I gotta come over here and start. wildfire exploded early Thursday morning, burning nearly 25,000 acres. The fire has forced new evacuations this morning. The fire moved up a ridge line and then caught the Santa Ana winds perfectly. In the summer of 2008, nearly 2,000 lightning sparked wildfires scorched over a million acres across California, destroying hundreds of structures and impacting the lives in the surrounding communities forever. Yeah, I never thought it was going to happen to me. Um, you know, you always figure it's the other guy that's going to get their house burned. And with California's Mediterranean climate, another fire siege of that magnitude is just a matter of time. I'm Cal Fire's Daniel Berlant. Devastating wildfires occur every year across the state, putting lives, property, and the state's natural resources at a constant threat. In California, wildfires aren't a question of if, but only a question of when. If you choose to live near a natural area of the state, you are at risk for wildfires, and it's your responsibility to prepare yourself, your family, and your home. And that preparation starts with three simple steps. Ready, set, go. Getting ready before wildfire happens is a vital first step in protecting yourself and your property. Beginning in the spring months, well before the peak of fire season, you should carefully assess your property and start taking steps to prepare for the hotter months to come. As firefighters are responding to fires throughout California, one of the most important things they can look for is defensible space. Defensible space is the required 100 feet between your property and the surrounding wildland area. Defensible space has consistently been shown to be the best, most practical first line of defense for your home against wildfires. Adequate defensible space provides a barrier to slow, or in some cases even halt, the progress of fire that would otherwise engulf your property. It also helps ensure the safety of firefighters while they defend your home. I'm going to have to go to homes that provide some type of clearance for my firefighters. I cannot go to a home that needs, um, has brush and everything growing right up to it. I've got to pick a home where I can safely make a stand and if we get stuck there that we can survive it as well. 
When the destructive lightning siege fires burned throughout California in 2008, defensible space once again proved to be a key element around the homes that survived, while many homes without adequate clearance were not as fortunate. But defensible space isn't the only factor in protecting your property. Another critical step is hardening your home. During a wildfire, loose flying embers can find weak points on the outside of your home. Hardening your home means reinforcing these vulnerabilities. Cal Fire Battalion Chief Nick Schuler demonstrates some of the components of a well-defended home. As you see here, they have an excellent green belt around their home. All of their trees are limbed up so there's no dead and dying vegetation around their home. And as you can see, as we walk along, all the leaf litter has been picked up and we move straight into the fire-resistant construction. They have the stucco siding. They have the enclosed eaves and the composite roof, all proactive steps that this homeowner has taken to reduce fire potential. Now that you have your home ready for a wildfire, it's time to get set by preparing your most valuable assets, your life and the lives of your family. You should start by creating a wildfire action plan. A wildfire action plan gives you and your family a chance to plan out and write down important information and special preparations that you'll need to take as a wildfire approaches. As part of your wildfire action plan, you want to sit down with your family and talk about things like escape routes, uh, what roads are you going to take when you leave the house, and the other thing is where are you going to go. You want to have a meeting location. Your family's plan will be unique depending on your circumstances, so it's vital that you practice and update it regularly to keep everybody prepared. It's also important to plan which belongings in your house you'll need to take with you in case of evacuation if you have time. Prepare what you're going to take with you when you leave. There's nothing worse than packing up to leave and you realize you didn't take anything that you really wanted to. You took stuff that just was the first thing you saw. Wildfires can move quickly and can change direction into a surrounding community without warning. With the assurance that your home is now well defended and your family's wildfire action plan in place, when a wildfire approaches, you're now ready to go. During a wildfire, emergency personnel may not be able to warn everybody, so it's up to you to take the initiative to stay informed by listening to the TV or radio for announcements. If an evacuation is imminent, it's time to set your wildfire action plan into motion. Don't wait to be ordered to leave your residence, just go, and go early. By leaving early, you give your family the best chance of surviving a wildfire. Follow the directions of fire and law enforcement, and if you feel threatened, you need to go ahead and get out of that home. We have a lot of systems in place to notify you of that, but you have to be willing to get out and get out early. Although wildfires can be unpredictable, destructive, and deadly, they're an undeniable part of California's wildland. Wildfire is coming, and it's the steps you take now that will ensure you, your family, and your home have a fighting chance when it happens. For more information on how to prepare for wildfires and for a wildfire action plan checklist, visit readyforwildfire.org. All right, good evening. I'm going to briefly talk about evacuation and routes because uh, I've already been told I've taken up too much time up here. So more of you would have laughed if I was a firefighter, I'm sure. Anyway, I talk about major routes in San Carlos. Most of you know main thoroughfares. Uh, you have your Britton, Howard, San Carlos Avenue, El Camino, Industrial, Alameda corridors. You have uh, a lot of side streets, though. In the event of evacuation, keep in mind that some of those main thoroughfares, they may become congested. They, you may be deterred to a different route. Talk about preparedness, we could spend all night talking about preparedness. There are certain exercises you can do as a household, such as putting together your action plan, um, talking about what would be your plan, what would you do, even practicing an evacuation. Uh, just a simple, what would we do if this street was closed or we had to go a different route? How many of you drive on streets every day and you don't even realize what the name of the street is, but you just know how to get somewhere? good opportunity to maybe explore, make it a fun exercise. Talking about being ready and having certain things staged, uh, there's a lot of recommendations out there. 
if you're worried about having copies of personal identifying information or photographs that are really important to you, what you can do is you can store a lot of those on little media storage devices, some of them that are encrypted with a code. You wanna keep all those items secure though, but readily accessible. Maintaining your vehicles, how many of you are guilty about letting your car get down to that E, letting the light come back on? Try to keep that gas tank above uh, half and try to keep those electrical vehicles charged. During the event of evacuation, it's important to stay calm. In order for you to help those in your household, you have to help yourself first. Calm down, take a deep breath, put a plan together, and then put action to it. We need you to listen. When a first responder is giving you direction or giving you an order, that's not the time to argue. Our biggest goal is to save and help as many lives as we can. When you take time to argue or to maybe debate certain things, you could be delaying us from helping other people, things to take into consideration. As you're leaving the area, try to do so in a calm, orderly manner. As you're leaving, emergency assets are coming in, so we need to have access. Again, just zooming in, it's a good idea to know some routes, know your community, go on walks, get an idea of what's around and how you would use these different areas. Uh, the chief did a good job about talking about evacuation tips and how we don't have a set plan on how or what routes you'd wanna take because in the event of a wildfire, it could be it could be adjusting and it could be a very fluid situation. Uh, looking at this for preparing for something like a wildfire, you could also apply that to another type of natural event or natural disaster. So this is a good chance for you and your households, your neighborhoods to start a dialogue and think what would we do in the event of this type of emergency. All right. So real quick, we hear a lot about the police fire uh, competition. We work very well with our law enforcement partners. No, no rivalry whatsoever. Um, but do you know what police and fire both have in common? They both want to be firefighters. <laughs> what I'm going to do now is I'm going to turn it back over to PCRC. We're going to break into our, our subgroups and uh, have that discussion. And uh, several of us will be floating around the room. If you have questions for us, we can, uh, we can chime into whatever discussion you're having at the table as well. So. Uh, one question was, um, we have a fire hydrant in front of our house and it's on a cul-de-sac and there's no hose there. How can we get the neighbors to fund the hose? We, the fire department would not recommend having uh, a plan where you're going to be using a uh, hose to fight a fire. We want you to leave the area. Um, so we would not recommend that you would set up anything at your house where you're pumping out of your pool or anything like that. Um, let us do the firefighting and we just want you to leave as early as possible. Um, uh, one of the questions that we had also is, is when fire is spreading, there's something that we call ember cast. And it's those embers that are blowing, especially when you have high winds. Um, and that ember cast is what goes through the air and sometimes can land uh, pretty far away. I mean, sometimes in really bad conditions, we can see new starts a mile out in front of a fire. That ember cast is also something to be aware of when you're deciding which way you need to go, that's gonna be your indication. Just look the way the smoke is going and you don't wanna be under that smoke. You wanna get out of that area. Um, so if that gives you a little bit of something to look at, um, remember that that ember cast really is, what, is one of the main ways that fights, not just about the fire front burning, okay? Question, is there any uh, technology in use that would be able to help direct through Google or Apple Maps um, the quickest exit routes in case of fire. Um, not yet, but it's coming. So there is one of the technologies that is being looked at in addition to cameras are uh, a sensor that would be along a roadway. And if that sensor is impacted uh, by heat, it would sense that and say, this is not a viable way to get out. It's just not ready for prime time yet. There's a huge push on the technology side through a lot of different uh, technologies that we're going to see a lot of changes um, over the next com coming years because there's a lot of com private companies uh, jumping aboard to develop this stuff. Um, but that is coming. Um, we've talked about it. It's just not quite ready for, for prime time. Yep. Okay. 
Um, what, uh, what fuels fires more, homes or vegetation fires? So we saw in, typically vegetation fires are the ones that advance rapidly. What we saw in Santa Rosa because of the uh, winds, they were 50, 60, 70 miles an hour, that that fire transitioned from a wildland fire and then was propagating from home to home because of those winds. Um, so obviously structure fires tend to stay fairly stationary for us when they're out of, outside of the context of um, a wildfire, but uh, both fuel them. They just behave differently. Um, what are fuel breaks? Uh, fuel breaks are those areas where we will put in a uh, a, a, a break in the brush that is at least uh, two to three times the width or the height of whatever fuel it is that we are trying to stop a fire, and that's an area where we can make a stand and, and stop the advancement of the fire. Is there someone in the fire department who can come to our home to assess the preparedness um, of the home and surrounding areas to protect against fire? Um, unfortunately, we don't have the staffing that we would be able to do an assessment on a home. What we want to do is turn you towards our website to look at all the information that we have there, review the stuff that we've given you tonight. Um, that will give you a really good starting point. And what we will come out for is if you have a code complaint, if you see somebody's private property that is not being maintained, um, if you call the uh, fire department business line, uh, we will respond out and investigate code violations. Um, are you planning on to expand these meetings to Emerald Hills? I, after doing this a couple of times, the positive feedback that we've gotten, I do um, see that we're going to end up doing more of these community meetings over time. Um, so th the first two ones were you guys were our guinea pigs, and uh, um, your feedback is welcome. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I do see that we're going to end up doing quite a few more of these meetings. So with that, what we're going to be doing, what PCRC is going to be helping us, is all of your comments and questions and everything that they've captured here um, is going to be put together um, into a report um, and that we will actually post online so you can actually look and see what uh, the other tables brought up, what other ideas may have come up that is helpful for some neighbors, and uh, all that information will be made available to you. And with that, that is the uh, end of our, our program tonight. We will be I'm kind of milling about in the back of the room. Feel free to come up and ask any questions. Again, I appreciate all of you coming out. This was a, a big commitment of time, and uh, thank you for coming out. Do you have